Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. You know, all across the world, people are destitute, including children. In the Middle East, due to the increased destabilization of multiple countries, some because of our government here in America, children are left with no other options than living in the street, being sold into marriage, or even worse, human trafficking. The new film, Capernaum, follows a street-smart child recounting the events that lead him to sue his family for being born. The movie is harrowing and beautiful. It's cast with mainly unprofessional actors, and it is culled together over the course of a number of years. It's astonishing. Let's take a look at the trailer. Everybody, please welcome director uh, Nadine Labaki and producer Khaled Muzanir. Let's hear it. Thank you. Um, wow. Uh, thank you so much for making this film and for working so incredibly hard on the film. Uh, we could start by talking about what it's about, but I want to talk about the process because a lot of it is non-professional actors who have uh, experiences similar to that of their characters, right? Does that mean that you found that you cast these people and then started crafting the story around them, or you looked for people who had similar stories? Uh, no, yeah, I actually looked for people who had similar stories. So we had a very strong, solid script uh, with all these characters and and that was very based on the research we did because we did research for three years and we, we and everything that was written was very much based on everything we had seen. And then after we had the script uh, done, we started looking in real life in those slums, in those streets for the characters that are almost living the same situation. Uh, of course, you know, some things are different, but but it's very, very, in, in a lot of things, it's very similar to their own experience, to their own struggle, to their own story, in a way. So three years of research. What, yes. When did you decide that you wanted to jump into all of this research, that you were going to take three years to research for the script? Uh, you know, everything started gradually. And I think, you know, I'm not the only one being moved and frustrated with all those, you know, stories and pictures of kids being deprived from, you know, their most basic rights, whether children working or whether children being separated from their families on the Mexican border, whether Indian children working to feed their families or, or Syrian children uh, dying from chemical weapons in Syria. We've been bombarded lately um, with s this side of children um, in those 
you know, very, very difficult situations. And, and, and you always have the feeling that they're paying the highest price for our faults, children that didn't even ask to be here. Whether it's a Syrian child or Lebanese or Palestinian or Indian, a child is a child. And unfortunately, they're paying the highest price. And, and so it was mainly the sight of these children, especially, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, the, the, um, uh, uh, Alan Kurdi, the Syrian uh, kid that was found dead on the shores of Turkey. The, chi the child on the beach. Yes, yeah. on the beach. And I remember very, very clearly when I saw this picture, I thought, you know, when you see this frail, tiny little body, I thought, if this child could talk, what would he say? What would he tell us? What would he, how would he address the world? The world and the society that has completely failed him. Because this is what we, we do we do every day, and this is what we did. What did, what did he think when you know, his, his body hit the waves and he was struggling? And, and when he took that rubber, um, that small plastic rubber, ba rubber um, boat, uh, did he know where he was going? What were his dreams? What, so it was basically this, wanting to understand what is the point of view of those children towards the world they live in and toward this injustice that, that they are living every day. And it's not, we're not talking about a hundred children or a thousand children. We're talking about millions of ch children across the world. There's 280 million children now working to feed their families. Working meaning deprived from school, deprived from you know their most basic rights. So, what is their point of view towards those adults who are us, who have who are failing them every day? Because this is not what, what what's supposed to happen. So it was really based on all that and wanting to become the voice of those children and wanting to understand, you know, when you see so many children begging on the street, living in Lebanon, and Lebanon has hosted, you know, over a million and a half Syrian refugees. And Lebanon, Lebanon is a small, very small country, so it's almost half the population. So it's, Lebanon is struggling a lot. So the sight of children on the street is something that is really actually part of our daily lives. So I thought, you know, what goes on in the head of this child that is standing next to my car window and that is looking at me, not looking at him? How does it feel to be invisible? How does it feel to be non-existent? And this is how it all started, wanting to know more. And the research started, and then the film, and then the script, and then... Would you say that it was, a, on your part, an attempt to rehumanize something that had become somewhat dehumanized because we've become so desensitized to... I, I mean, I don't know if I've become desensitized, but we're Absolutely. seeing so many of them. Yeah. Clearly, as a, as, a, as a world, we're becoming slightly desensitized. Exactly, and I think this is, this is the mission of, uh, of cinema. It actually, this is what it does. It, the empathy it, it, machine. It, exactly. It humanizes something that you hear about in the news or talk about in figures and numbers. And, it, and you sort of understand it, but in a very abstract way. You can't really put a face on the problem. And this is what cinema actually does. It humanizes. It puts a face. And this time, it's the face of a child who's struggling. It can be a child or a man or a woman, but it, this is what it does. You, you, empathize, you empathize differently when you actually know what the real struggle is. You know what those real feelings are, what this kid is going through, how he thinks, what is, is his everyday uh, war, his everyday struggle to survive. It's a completely different, I think, um, reaction, especially when you know that this child or this man or woman that you're watching on the big screen is actually living the same struggle in their daily lives because this is what, in this film, this is what it's, we're doing. It's not an actor. It's, it's a child who's almost living the same conditions in his real life. So you leave the theater knowing that you've left them there in this struggle. I think it does have a completely different impact on you as a human being, knowing that you've empathized with this person for two hours, you've known that what their real struggle is, and I think it ignites some kind of call for action. It makes me want, it makes you want to do something about it and help in a way, I think. You know, one of the things that you said was how we as adults have failed them 
And what I found so fascinating was the boogeymen of, of these children are not just the adults, but they're the leaders of the country. Assad is consistently referenced as a sort of like last uh, at last bad act. I will, th I will throw, throw you to Assad. And when we talk about child separation on the Mexican border here, you can imagine people saying, well, Trump will get you taken away. And it's this idea that not just as adults that we have failed us, but those who are supposed to lead us globally around the world have become have actually our boogeymen. They've become our monsters in Absolutely. a lot of ways. I, Is I that something agree. that you found in your research? Yes, m many times, many times, because also they speak uh, about politics in their own words. And it, it's exactly it. You, you, you know, you've, you've put the finger on it because they're, they don't know how to express it in a different way. And they are, they become their sort of their boogeyman a, uh, because it's, it's the only way for them to express themselves. And actually when this child is suing uh, his parents in the film, because this is how the film starts. He's not only showing his parents; he's he's using his own uh, child uh, or children's words, uh, but he's actually suing the whole world. Why am I here? For, why am I here? And it was actually inspired by everything they've told me, because during the research, I spoke to many children, and I'm speaking about children who've been victims of extreme neglect abuse, mistreatment, neglect, uh, violence. So, so I used to ask them one question at the end of the conversation every time. Children in prisons, in homes, in shelters, in detention centers. Uh, so are you happy to be alive? I used to ask them this question. And unfortunately, most of the times, the answer is no. I'm not happy to be alive. I don't belong in your world. I don't know why I'm here. Why am I here if I'm going to be beaten up every day, if I'm ne never going to eat when I'm hungry, if I'm going to be abused, if I'm going to be uh, raped, if nobody's going to ever say a nice word to me, why am I here? Why am I being punished? For what am I being punished? There's this angry why all the time that you hear on... Uh, and and it's, they express it very, very clearly because they have a sense of what's right and what's wrong. We're talking about children who are very wise because they've lived on the street, they've had to survive like adults. They're not children anymore. Unfortunately, a lot of them have, are, are in such a um, state of shock that they don't even react anymore. Like children who are, who are completely empty. You put a toy in front of them, they don't play. Can you imagine a child who's three years old that doesn't play, that doesn't sing, that doesn't cry, that doesn't talk? They're in such a state of shock that there's nothing there anymore. So it was all inspired by that. I just wanted to translate this anger in a way. How, how do we translate it? And it was like a hit me all of a sudden. That's it. This is going to be a story of a child who is going to sue the world for bringing him into this life without giving him his most, you know, the tools to survive. Okay, you bring me into this world and what do you expect me to just survive? You expect life to take care of me? It doesn't work this way. And, and he, he, he's, he's, he, he was going to stand there in front of, of justice and say, say it clearly. I think one of the great things that you also do in the film is that he is not a, um, an orphan. He has no. parents. And as much as we, without those courtroom scenes, we would sort of paint those parents probably as just villains. But yes. you have these very uh, heartbreaking moments where the parents have to defend themselves in front, in, in front of the court. And you get to see that, of course, they have a pride in their children and they have a love for their children. It's their children. But they as well are in a very similar situation of the ch uh, as the child. Um, I, yeah. I read that your first cut was 12 hours long, something like that. <laughs> yeah. And I also read that you mortgaged your house to sort of finish the film. Is that true? Why, why, what, what happened? Why was the process so long? I mean, I guess thankfully it was because the product is so beautiful. But what was happening? Yeah, I think from the very beginning, while we were working on the script, we knew that to reach this perfection in the uh, in the child's acting, I mean, uh, for me, it's one of the best performances I've ever seen in cinema. I would agree by with that. Kids. So, and to reach this, we needed to shoot a lot of uh, 
uh, a lot of hours of shooting, a lot of months of shooting, and we knew that no producer would ever accept it to do this. I'm not a producer, I'm a music composer, and w we're married, basically. Uh, so I have one of those relationships, too. Uh, <laughs> Basically, yeah. Basic. So, uh, so we knew that we have to do it uh, ourselves. So we we shot for for six months. We have over five hundred hours of shooting. So yeah, as you said, the first version of the film was twelve hours, and I had to score it in the meantime while while I was producing and preparing. And so we didn't have anyone with us uh, on board f when we started the process. So I had to put our home on mortgage to 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 start without telling her, of course, because I wanted her to f to to focus on the film. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Good man. Uh, thank you. <laughs> My beard was black when we started Before the film. Before he had, yeah, he didn't have any white uh, hair. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so we jumped into this this universe. I mean, the whole family. What was your yeah. crew like uh, on a day to day basis? How big was your crew? Working with um, working with the, the the child actor. I'm sorry. What is the forget the child's name? Zane. Zane. Uh, the the Zane uh, El Rafi and uh, and the other child is actually a girl. Her, her name is Treasure. Treasure, right? Here. Treasure. Yes. Wow. It's, she, it's it's a girl. And in the film, it's a boy. Uh, his name is Jonas in the film, but in real life, her name is Treasure, and she was a treasure. She was a real treasure. You, I mean, you've seen the film. She's a beautiful Sometimes child. She was yeah. a miracle in the film. And they were both miracles. You know, Capernaum means chaos and miracles. And it was exactly this during the whole shooting. Dane was chaos, chaos and... and we, no, we <laughs> were living in a chaos. It was an organized chaos, but it's a chaos. You know, shooting in those slums with those realities, with the reality of these people. It was a very, very difficult shoot. You know, shooting with their... We were shooting in the slums. Basically, sometimes we would be standing in the sewers. You know, you can imagine the smell. You can imagine the deprivation. No water, no electricity, no food uh, most of the time. So you are living their struggle. You are living their reality. And it was very, you know... Um, psychologically difficult because we all had to, the whole crew, we were in, in this together and, and at the end of the day we would go back to our houses and our homes and sleep in a warm bed. And you know that you've left them there in this situation. It was very, very hard. The whole, I mean, we're all different now, every one of us that was in this shoot. There's a before and after for us. Uh, we completely changed, uh, each one of us, each person that was on, on, on this adventure. And we had a somewhat small crew because we, time and, and money needed to go on time. We needed to really have the time to build this relationship, build this trust, create this space for them to be who they are. Because we've never, I've never asked them to act, I just asked them to be who they are in a certain situation and react with their own personality, in their own rhythm, with their own nature to, the cre to those scenes that we've created. So it's always, you know, navigating their reality, their truth towards the fiction that we have created. So it was always like this, you know, um, give and take between fact and fiction the whole time. You know, often when we get movies about um, poverty, incre incredible poverty, you know, um, they have a, a, um, an uplift at some point in the movie where everything changes for the person. I think of Slumdog Millionaire, you know, he yeah. goes on to Who Wants to Be a Millionaire or um, that film that came out with uh, Nicole Kidman uh, like a year or two ago where he has in the adopted family. Rarely do we stay in with them while they are poor and kind of Leave it that way, because that's how most people are. I'm wondering if you ever hesitated about that, if you ever wanted to add a more uplifting narrative to it, because so often filmmakers and producers, I think, get very worried about what yeah. the audience is going to have to go through. Thankfully, no, you didn't do that. But it, I felt this responsibility to actually reflect the reality. It wasn't. I wasn't entitled to imagine the story or imagine like sort of a happy ending or an uplifting situation to attract audience. That was not the aim. The aim is to attract audience to the reality and not uh, imagine it or fantasize it. 
That was my responsibility. My responsibility is to be the vehicle and the platform for them to express their reality and their struggle. And I felt this very strongly. Of course, it's entertaining because uh, the film has a story. It's and not the kid only is incredibly charismatic. Exactly, and it's not only a documentary. It is a fiction, but it's a fiction based on reality. And I wanted it to be this way. And I, we need, we, 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 we wanted to intervene the least possible. There is a fiction, but we had to be, in a way, the most invisible possible in order for reality to just you know, happen in front of us, and we navigate this reality toward the fiction that we had written. So it was very challenging, and it was an interesting process, N not like a normal kind of situation of, uh, uh, you know, a script where you, where you need to exactly uh, um, execute what, what, what's written. It was, because you can't really expect a child to do what you want him to do when you want him to do it. So sometimes we would shoot things or reactions that were not exactly meant for that scene that we were shooting at that moment. But we knew that we were gonna take it and incorporate it in a different w scene. So we had this really freedom we weren't, the, the, the most important thing is not to be scared, not to be scared of where this film can lead you sometimes and where life can lead you. And you have to be very ready to be, or to, in order to capture it. And I had an amazing crew of, 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 of passionate people who were just there for the film, for us, for whatever was happening. And a, and a, a, and a cinematographer who was, always there and so talented and so devoted in order to really capture every moment and not be scared of sometimes, you know, sometimes we would, would completely like start improvising and knowing where we were gonna land because we have a very strong stri script, but really not be scared to go with the flow. And if, if it's not gonna work today, it's gonna work tomorrow. And it's really the fact that, you know, we produced it and my husband produced it that gave me this freedom. Otherwise, it would have been impossible to do it. You essentially had the freedom to be on set and be like, okay, this isn't happening right now. We'll make it happen tomorrow. Whereas on most sets, you'd be like, oh my God, this isn't happening right now. Everything is falling apart. We're not going to finish our movie. And sometimes you, you, you actually leave a scene not satisfied right. when, when you're in a different structure, when you're in a more classical structure. It was impossible for me to do that kind of concession. If, uh, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right, even if it takes three weeks to shoot a scene. We knew, uh, we started shooting not knowing when we were going to stop. And uh, every, every month we'd say, okay, maybe this is the last month. And then we'd uh, go on for How many months month. was it? Six months. months. Six months. Yeah. Every day? Wow. So two years of post-production, <laughs> editing. Two years of editing. Wow. You know, I have to ask, when people make documentaries or something close to documentary like this, you become very close with your subjects. Um, what, was that, what was that like for you? Because as you said, you would go home to your home in your warm bed. So uh, what was that like for you and what was that like for them? And where did you leave off when the film was done? The, you know, they're part of my family now. The, it's impossible to just, you know, turn the page and say, I move on. Uh, now Zane, hope, you know, a small miracle again happened with, with, with Zane. He's, he's now in Norway. He's resettled with all his family because the UNHCR was helping us along the way during the whole shoot and even before. And, and they, uh, they, they resettled Zane in Norway now with all his family. He's going to school for the first time is in his life. You know, when we were shooting, he didn't even know how to write his own name. And now he's going to school. He has a beautiful house overlooking the sea. He's playing in a garden in the forest. It's a completely different life. And uh, uh, Treasure is back in Kenya. She's going to school too. She's not a forbidden child anymore the way she was. Because in, in Lebanon, she was living exactly the same situation. She was a forbidden child because she's the daughter of two migrant workers who were living illegally in Lebanon. So it's like this. It's this small miracles are, are happening with all the families. The children, uh, all the children are not on the streets anymore because most of them were on the streets, they, they used to you know, sell gum and stuff. 
like that on the street. Now they're not on the streets anymore. So it's not easy. We, we've, we've, we've created a, an, um, a f uh, foundation uh, f to be able to help. It's not easy, you know, but it's happening slowly. And you can't, you can't just, you know, you have this, they're part of our family now. We, we have to just continue and see how, how this is going to develop for each one of them. What was it like showing them footage and showing them cuts? Like Zane, for instance, like, did you ever bring him into the editing room and show him what you were doing and the whole process? And how did he respond to that? And what, what did that make him feel like? You know, Zane is a very strong, uh, confident boy. So for him, when you ask him, he says, yeah, of course, of course, I'm great. <laughs> of course, I'm, I'm, I'm amazing. <laughs> of course, I, I, I'm not surprised that this is, you know, he's, he's very, he has a great personality and he's very strong and he's very wise. And he felt like he was part of this mission. He, in, in a way, he felt he was the voice of those kids that he was representing because Zane has seen a lot. Growing up on the street, you know, the street is, was his school and he's seen a lot of abuse and, and mistreatment and, and children being married at 11 years old were neighbors of his or children being abused or raped. Or, uh, he's seen it and he had to struggle also every day to exist, fights. And, and you know, when you see those kids fighting, they're on the verge of dying every time. It's so violent. So he... He, he, he was confident that what he was doing is actually reflecting this reality. He, he knew it. And so he's, he's very confident when he sees the, you know, when he sees the edit, when he's in a, in a screening, and when people talk to him, when people ask him questions. But still, he's a very wild child, you know. He's not, he's not very disciplined. You have to know how to talk to him. And, yeah. Uh, we actually have a, a question coming in from Twitter. It's from uh, Skates NYC. They want to know, uh, what do you see as the solution to break the cycle uh, of these lost children? When is it too late to save a child in abject poverty? It's difficult to, it's difficult to have one solution. You know, during my research, I, 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 we saw, we tried to see the problem from many different angles. And there's a lot of, of failures in the system. There's a systemic chaos, actually, that is not helping these children. And it starts from the moment they are born. Uh, in Lebanon, for example, you have to pay money in order to be able to register your children. The papers, right? The papers. Yeah. So it starts there. From the moment zero, this child doesn't have any right because he's not registered, because obviously his parents don't have the money. So it starts from there. I even you know when they are conceived, those children, most of them, I spoke to so many also parents and mothers, lots of mothers, unfortunately, from the moment they are pregnant, they know that this child is not going to be theirs. She knows that at, at age, at six months, she's going to give him away to an orphanage because she can't raise him. So this child, from the moment that he is even conceived, he doesn't have a chance because he's not going to be raised by his parents. And this is where the problem starts. So there's, we have to go back to the system. The system has to, there's a lot of things that need to enter in, in, the, in, the, um, in the equation. It's not, there's not one solution. There's, you have to see the problem from many different angles, from the justice uh, angle and from the parents, from the education. You know, it's, it, this is what we need to discuss, and this is what we're trying to do in Lebanon also. When we finish, you know, with all the tour and all that, we're going to organize screenings for the government with the help of certain organizations like UNHCR, like UNICEF, and like the, you know, the organizations that deal with children's rights, and to be able to talk and organize roundtable and see what can really be done. Um, I think we have some questions from the audience. Who is it right here? Hi. Hi, first of all, thank you so much for Carmel. It was my first Lebanese movie that I ever saw. It was wonderful, thank, thank you. you. Um, my question is, uh, Zane befriends a woman and child from Ethiopia. How did that occur or how, how did that idea come up about? Um, 
this was an idea that was very also natural because uh, Lebanon also have uh, have um, a, a big um, a migrant worker community uh, living from Ethiopia or from Africa or Kenya or Nigeria or Philippines or and and unfortunately uh, the system another failure of the system and another systemic chaos uh, we live in they live in a sponsorship system that doesn't allow them to have their own freedom so um, uh, actually zain in real life could have met somebody like Rahil, the Ethiopian girl, who's living in Lebanon illegally because she ran away from her employer because she wasn't happy, obviously, at her employer's house, so she ran away. And in this case, she ran away because she was pregnant. And also, that's another also uh, injustice of the system. They are not allowed to have children. Um, so in, the, in the, f the film, she hides her child, and this is where she meets Zane, and, and Zane takes care of her child. But this is a story that, that actually could have happened in Lebanon, in those communities of, you know, and, and in those um, belts of, of, of misery and, and, and invisible communities that surround our cities and our lives. Those communities actually... Uh, live in, 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 in those neighborhoods, live together. And in real life, Zayn could have actually met somebody like Rahil. And where did you find the woman who, who plays Rahil? Also, she was living in the same circumstances. Uh, 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 the casting director met her on the streets. Mm. And actually, the first encounter was a little bit difficult because she was a little bit scared, scared to talk to somebody. Uh, because she was in an illegal situation. And uh, Yordan, her name is Jordanus. She's actually lived in very difficult circumstances ever since she was a child. She was an orphan at, at three years old. So she had to take care of her, her siblings. And she had a very, very difficult life until she ended up in Lebanon. And in Lebanon, obviously, also she worked in many different houses, wasn't happy, ended up on the uh, being very uh, completely illegal, no papers, nothing. And this is where we met her. And the casting director met her and interviewed her. And, and you know, there was a sort of trust relationship that happened gradually. And of course, as soon as I saw Yordanos and we spoke, I could see, you know, everything about her, her eyes, the way she is and the way she reacts to think to things that she was actually exactly the person to to be uh, Rahil in the film. Um, next question. Hi, um, the film looks beautiful. The trailer itself just was breathtaking. Um, and I love all the um, topics you've covered um, that you've been speaking about today. Um, I'm curious, what's the biggest takeaway you would like audiences to have when they watch the film? Um, I, think, I think to really change perspectives and really start not only looking but seeing because that's what we usually unfortunately do we look but we don't really see because we think it's not our problem we think you know these children belong to a community of people and we don't really want to know about it because it doesn't concern us this is a child of somebody else and let his parents take care of him or what doesn't why doesn't he work or what doesn't he so for me that's it just understanding that of course I w everybody understands it, but but cinema actually humanizes it and puts a face on the problem, and and you start seeing the real struggle of these children, and you and you start really empathizing with it, and it's not anymore a child that belongs to a community. You're actually seeing that child, and it is uh, this is how it started. I wanted to know more. What happens when this child disappears around the corner, and I don't see him anymore? Where does he go? Who is what is who is his family? What is his life? What is his daily struggle? And actually, I'm so happy to see how people do change perspective. People come up to me and tell me, you know, I'm not looking the same way anymore at this child that I see standing in the you know, on the corner of the street or begging or selling gum. I'm, I'm looking at them in a different way, in a different light. So that's it for me. I think we have time for one more. It's walking up right now. Hi. Um, I wanted to know, uh, since this is a very serious topic, and I personally commend you for making the sacrifices that you did to get this story out here, um, what kept you motivated throughout the entire process? 
I think it's the fact that you feel like you're part of a mission. You're part of something bigger than you. Even though it was very hard, it was very difficult to shoot uh, in very difficult conditions for every one of us, this is what kept us going. Especially that sometimes, you know, things, crazy things would happen. Like uh, um, in the film, the Ethiopian girl gets, uh, gets arrested. But two days in, in, in real life, she gets arrested, really, in real life, two days after that scene. So we start, and, and she, she goes through exactly what she goes through in the film. And the mother and father of the child also get arrested with her. So when we're shooting those scenes with the child on his own, without his mother, it's, it's actually reality. He was without his mother in real life. So this gives you a sort of impression that you're part of something bigger than you. It's, it's actually happening. It's like uh, Life is imitating art in a way. And or art is imitating life, I don't, you, you don't know anymore. So it's like, it, you, you have a feeling that there's something bigger than you that is pushing you to make the, this, this film. And this keeps you going. Well, thank God it did. It's a beautiful film. Congratulations. Um, it opens this week in theaters. People, people can see it. And please do go see it in the theater. It's a, it's a gorgeous film, an incredible achievement. And give them a huge round of applause for being here. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.